perhaps their loyalty is misguided. Perhaps Erkun is right, and I will betray that loyalty, and bring doom to the Dragon Isle. His moody, crimson eyes looked directly into hers. Perhaps I should have died as I left my mother's womb. Then Erkun would have become Emperor. His fate been thwarted? Fate is never thwarted. What has happened has happened because fate willed it thus, if indeed there is such a thing as fate, and if men's actions are not merely a response to other men's actions. Elric took a deep breath and offered her an expression tinged with irony. Your logic leads you close to heresy, Simara. If we are to believe the traditions of Mount Ibene, perhaps it would be better if you forgot your friendship with me. She laughed. You begin to sound like my brother. Are you testing my love for you, my lord? He began to remount his horse. No, Simaril, but I would advise you to test your love yourself, for I sense there is a tragedy implicit in our love. As she swung herself back into her saddle, she smiled and shook her head. You see doom in all things. Can you not accept the good gifts granted you? They are few enough, my lord. Aye, I'll agree with that. They turned in their saddles, hearing hoofbeats behind them. Some distance away they saw a company of yellow-clad horsemen riding about in confusion. It was their guard which they had left behind, wishing to ride alone. Come, cried Ulrich, through the woods and over yonder hill and they'll never find us. They spurred their steeds through the sun-speared wood and up the steep sides of the hill beyond, racing down the other side and away across a plain where noidal bushes grew, their lush poison fruit glimmering a purplish blue, a night colour which even the light of day could not disperse. There were many such peculiar berries and herbs on Mount Ibene, and it was some of them which Elric owed his life. Others were used for sorcerous potions, and had been sown generations before by Elric's ancestors. Now, few Malnibaneans left Imria, even to collect these harvests. Only slaves visited the greater part of the island, seeking the roots and the shrubs which made men dream monstrous and magnificent dreams, for it was in their dreams that the nobles of Malnibane found most of their pleasures. They had ever been a moody, inward-looking race, and it was for this quality that Imrur had come to be named the Dreaming City. There, even the meanest slaves chewed berries to bring them oblivion, and thus were easily controlled, for they came to depend on their dreams. Only Elric himself refused such drugs, perhaps because he required so many others simply to ensure his remaining alive. The yellow-clad guards were lost behind them, and once across the plain where the noidal bushes grew, they sh- slowed their flight and came at length to cliffs and then the sea. The sea shone brightly and languidly washed the white beaches below the cliffs. Seabirds wheeled in the clear sky and their cries were distant, serving only to emphasise the sense of peace which both Elric and Cimmeril now had. In silence, the lovers guided their horses down steep paths to the shore, and there they tethered their steeds and began to walk across the sand, Their hair, his white, hers jet black, waving in the wind which blew from the east. They found a great dry cave which caught the sounds the sea made and replied in a whispering echo. They removed their silken garments and made love tenderly in the shadows of the cave. They lay in each other's arms as the day warmed and the wind dropped, and then they went to bathe in the waters, filling the empty sky with their laughter. When they were dry and were dressing themselves, they noticed a darkening of the horizon, and Elric said, We shall be wet again before we return to Imrur. No matter how fast we ride, the storm will catch us. Perhaps we should remain in the cave until it has passed, she suggested, coming close and holding her soft body against him. No, he said, I must return soon, for there are potions in Imrur I must take if my body is to retain its strength. An hour or two longer and I shall begin to weaken. You have seen me weak before, Simmeril. She stroked his face, and her eyes were sympathetic. I have seen you weak before, Elric. Come, let's find the horses. By the time they reached the horses, the sky was grey overhead and full of boiling blackness, not far away in the east. They heard the grumble of thunder and the crash of lightning. The sea was threshing as if infected by the sky's hysteria. The horses snorted and pawed at the sand, anxious to return. 
Even as Elric and Cimmeril climbed into their saddles, large spots of rain began to fall on their heads and spread over their cloaks. Then suddenly they were riding at full tilt back to Imria, while the lightning flashed around them and the thunder roared like a furious giant, like some great old lord of chaos attempting to break through unbidden into the realm of earth. Cimmeril glanced at Elric's pale face, illuminated for a moment by a flash of sky fire. She felt a chill come upon her, and the chill had nothing to do with the wind or the rain, for it seemed to her that in that second, the gentle scholar she loved had been transformed into the, by the elements into a hell-driven demon, into a monster with barely a semblance of humanity. His crimson eyes had fled from the whiteness of his skull, like the very flames of the higher hell. His hair had been whipped upwards so that it had become the crest of a sinister warhelm, and by a trick of the stormlight, his mouth seemed twisted in a mixture of rage and agony. Suddenly Cimmeril knew. She knew profoundly that their morning's ride was the last moment of peace the two of them would ever experience again. The storm was a sign from the gods themselves, a warning of storms to come. She looked again at her lover. Elric was laughing. He had turned his face upward so that the warm rain fell upon him, so that the water splashed into his open mouth. The laughter was the easy, unsophisticated laughter of a happy child. Cimmeril tried to laugh back, but then she had to turn her face away so that he should not see it, for Cimmeril had begun to weep. She was weeping still when Imria came in sight, a black and grotesque silhouette against the line of brightness which was the as-yet-untainted western horizon.